interact with our speakers by typing in questions and comments using the questions pane. We will be having a Q&A round in a dedicated session towards the end of the presentation. Also, we are recording today's session and will make the link to the recording available 24 hours after the event via email. We would love to have you connect with us and keep the conversation going beyond today's event. And now on to today's speakers. Our first speaker is Neil Sharma, Managing Partner of Spice Technology Group, Inc. Neil is well recognized within the North American manufacturing, retail, and distribution sectors. He maintains active business relationships with several decision-making executives of blue chip organizations, industry analysts, and industry associations. Our guest speaker is Eric Demate, President of Fairbanks Management Service, Inc. He is a professional engineer and an advisor in all aspects of supply chain, including e-commerce and omnichannel. He has both led and consulted to organizations in Canada and Europe, assisting with their development, growth, and profitability. I'm now going to hand it off to Neil, but before we do that, we are going to put a quick poll on the screen. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, and uh, thank you to our, uh, to our guests on the webinar. So um, we're going to chat about this uh, concept called Omnichannel, and uh, with myself and uh, Eric here with me. Hi, everyone. So um, before, we get, before we get into the, uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of the presentation, I thought um, what we might do is spend a little bit of time kind of understanding you know, what the various aspects of Omnichannel mm -hmm. are. And uh, I think suffice it to say that it is a fairly complex discussion, and it can be easily broken up into sort of several major chunks that we look at, uh, both from a retail as well as from manufacturing, and then potentially from a distribution perspective as well for those industries. You know, this uh, graph in front of you or this slide is showing that um, really, if you look at retailers, for example, um, you know, they look at their world in these major, six major uh, chunks. You know, they plan, they buy, they make, they move, they sell, they service the products, and then they are prepared to take returns back from their consumers. And all of these really affect omni-channel. And I think, you know, this will, we will start to build upon this through the rest of the uh, presentation today. But today we will focus on this aspect of move, which is logistics and supply chain and how that affects omni-channel and hence the title is fulfillment strategies for omni-channel. In future webcasts we'll be talking about some of the other components such as how do you do planning and forecasting that affects omni-channel or what are the procurement activities associated with omni-channel. So with that um, I'd like to then perhaps you know, build on this for uh, the rest of the presentation but talk about the word complexity. I said, uh, you know, what is, you know, why is this complex? There is, there's a lot of conversation going on with omnichannel today. Some of it are, are sort of truth, some of it are half truth. There's a lot of, you know, buzz associated with it. But I think one thing is fairly clear to most organizations that are playing with omnichannel, which is the notion of complexity. You know, why is this complex? So this particular slide attempts to help, uh, attempts to describe, you know, or give some numbers behind what's driving complexities. So in a fairly traditional retail environment, and I'm going to take retail as a good example, but you know, the same thing is true for manufacturing and distribution. Let's just, if you take a, a retailer a department store, for example, or even a category retailer, in the bricks and mortar world today, they might be dealing with you know, a very high-end department store or a large retailer might be dealing with 100 to 200,000 SKUs. Department stores might reach half a million SKUs. If you take that world um, and start to look at potentially some category retailers or boutique retailers, um, you might be playing with 3,000, 5,000, maybe 6,000 SKUs, so much smaller SKU count. But if you take that world and you start to move into a dot-com world, so you will start to see an explosion of SKUs. And uh, you know, a, a well-known sort of you know well-talked about example is that of Walmart. They carry at a store 150,000, 200 uh, SKUs, 
but walmart.com will carry over a million SKUs. And now you suddenly see a factor of six, seven, eight times, potentially a 10 times explosion of SKUs going from a bricks and mortars world to an online world. This really, really starts to drive complexity. And you'll see that in the rest of the presentation, we'll talk about how a plethora of SKUs really drives and needs to drive the overall thinking for a retail organization, for a manufacturing company, and for a distribution company, and help to sort of simplify the complexity that you see in it. The last piece of this graph is really Amazon, and we dropped that in there just for the engineers on this call. You know, this is not to scale uh, from 1 million to 300 million. I'm sure you can see that. But just the point is that in, when you deal with a retailer like Amazon, you're dealing with 300 million SKUs for you know, what they have available for sale. That is a mind-blowing number in terms of you know, what is actually handled worldwide. So with that, let's kind of get on to a little bit of perhaps, if I am permitted to do a little bit of schooling on sort of what is omnichannel. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, I'm often asked by CIOs, by VPF merchandising, within retail, within distribution, and, and also now in, in manufacturing that are looking at this whole sort of world of omnichannel and say, what is omnichannel? And I'd like to take a start, pause back and say, look, we've all come from this world of multi-channel. And I think we're familiar with that term, which means that We've had multiple sales channels in our, in our past lives. We have sold as a retailer, we've sold to a very traditional point of sale environment. As retailers, we have also sometimes sold to B2B wholesale environments. We are now putting our sort of, you know, putting our, our, our you know, wetting our toes and moving forward on the web and mobile type of channels. But there are also emerging channels such as automated retail and kiosks. Um, if anybody's gone through Toronto Pearson Airport, you'll see Best Buy Express. That's an example of an automated retail uh, capability. You also have emerging channels of Amazon.com where retailers and manufacturers are utilizing that channel to, to, you know, to grow and lift sales. If you put all of this together and if these are unintegrated environments and each of these channels are dealt with differently, you have your classic multi-channel environment. Omni-channel is the ability to in fact tie all of these channels together and give the customer a single view into your organization and really give them these six you know, fundamental capabilities for executing. Um, one is you know, buy online, pick up at store or at DC. And you know, this, this is something certainly uh, that is being enabled through web and it also through mobile channels. Buy online, deliver to home buy online, return to store. And this again requires a single view of the customer. On the supply side, and this is often forgotten that you cannot really execute this integrated omni-channel world unless you have all of your supply and fulfillment channels also tied into your organization without any seams in between. And for those, you've got three basic capabilities, buy online, split ship, which is you can buy online, you can ship partially from a store, you could partially ship ship from a DC. You could also partially ship from a vendor, and that's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting split ship. You have the next capability of buy online and you ship from the vendor. The vendor ships on your behalf, and this is really what is causing the, the most excitement within the omni-channel world, within retail certainly, and certainly within distribution, with some interesting as, uh, impact points to manufacturing as well. And then you have this, you know, you know tied with the uh, buy online vendor ship, you have the endless aisle concept, which is, if you relate back to the earlier SKU slide that I talked about, you go from 100,000 SKUs to a million SKUs, that's your endless aisle program. The ability for you to aggregate the catalogs of all of your vendor manufacturers and make many more products available to them than what is physically possible in your, in your bricks and mortar world today. And that is the endless aisle program, which really drives a huge amount of opportunity for a retailer. With that, I'm going to hand off to, uh, to Eric to talk a little bit about the opportunities of e-commerce for retailers. Thank you, Neil. Uh, as Neil mentioned, this, this massive growth in the number of products available to consumers via e-commerce e also provides uh, retailers with an opportunity to steer or lead customers to more expensive items online that offer them a higher gross margin, this whole concept of endless aisle. For example, a more expensive patio furniture set than the one they might see in the bricks and mortar store, 
is available online, one with more pieces, more end tables, refiners, and the like. A camera with more features, more components, more lenses, or a heavier duty gas range, for example, than the ones in the store. This endless aisle provides customers with greater opportunity, but it also provides the retailers with the opportunity to upsell. This increases in many cases. What we have seen is that the retailer's sale transaction uh, online is higher than the transaction that they're getting per item in the store. And also that uh, a customer online having a good experience, enjoying the website, is making multiple purchases per transaction. Done right, a great online experience from start to finish creates a wonderful customer experience reinforces the retail brand and is every bit as comparable to their in-store in experience and in some cases even better than. Overall, this will lead to higher gross margins, but only if we carefully manage the end-to-end -end supply chain costs and we try to optimize that supply chain from manufacturer right through to the end consumer. This includes where we position each each SKU, each product in the supply chain, and how they are transported from manufacturer or importer or distributor through the supply chain right through to the end consumer. We'll talk more about this shortly. That's from a retailer's perspective. From a manufacturer's and the distributor's perspective, there's also some tremendous benefits coming from e-commerce. Our sense, however, is that manufacturers and distributors and carriers have a big opportunity that maybe not all of them are currently taking advantage of. They have an opportunity to further integrate themselves uh, and strengthen that relationship that they have with retailers and potentially create new channels direct to end consumers that create new revenue opportunities for themselves that they're not getting today. We all know uh, that the e-commerce market is growing rapidly uh, and uh, therefore they have an opportunity, manufacturers and distributors, to capture some of that volume that they're not getting today with sales in bricks and mortar stores not growing as rapidly as in the past. A, a, a recent internet retailer, massive uh, internet retailer conference in Chicago earlier this month attracted thousands of attendees for more than 600 companies in the e-commerce space. This is indeed a rapidly growing market. The key question, however, is how do we efficiently service these new and emerging sales channels? And how can I, as a distributor and carrier, take advantage of the opportunity to increase my revenue from e-commerce by providing my retail customers with additional services, such as kidding, uh, new types of labeling, uh, 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 multi-point scanning, automated appointment management, and even payment coordination. There's some golden opportunities here, but the conclusion is that while e-commerce provides a multitude of, of opportunities, these opportunities are different for retailers, manufacturers, and distributor carriers. So thanks. Um Eric, I think you know an interesting sort of takeaway from this is really you know this is a, a uh, an opportunity for anybody in this complex merchandise supply chain world from retailers, manufacturers to the distributors, and everybody wins. I think that's that's an important uh, sort of uh, takeaway here. So continuing on with that, I I'd sort of you know talk a little bit more now about you know what is you know how do we try to understand this complexity? We've talked about skew explosion. We've talked about you know, that driving complexity. We've talked about the opportunities for retailers, manufacturers, and distributors, but we haven't quite understood sort of what is it that, you know, how do we start to harness the opportunity in here? For, for that, we need to first understand, you know, and start to peel the layers of the onion. So as all the work that, that we do uh, with our uh, you know, customers, we look at our world in, you know, in, in this classic three-point approach, which is people, process, and technology. And so, again, if we take retail as an example, um, and again, no, not much different from manufacturing distribution for, for what we want to talk about here, but there's really, you know, from an organization perspective, there's four major departments that come into play uh, when you look at omni-channel. 
And you know, in the retail world, that's merchandising. In the manufacturing distribution world, that's the sales organization. Both manufacturing and retailers have a supply chain organization that is heavily impacted by omni-channel. This move towards omni-channel, they really need to kind of rethink how supply chain will work. And uh, you also have an operations department. In the retail world, this is the retail operations, how stores are managed, because stores are going to be impacted in the omni-channel world quite heavily. In the manufacturing world, this is the, uh, the supply and demand operations coming together and managing that entire world for how omni-channel will work. And this is a fairly important area because one component is incentives management within departments. You know, in the traditional world, in incentives within departments for sales are managed very traditionally. In the omni-channel world, it becomes a very difficult environment to say who gets the recognition for an online sale that takes place. And I think many organizations today, from a people perspective, are, are, are giving, are, you know, are, are taking a, a time to really understand how incentives will be managed so that the customer doesn't know the difference and he gets a single experience with you no matter where he buys or where she gets fulfilled her merchandise from. And I think that's a key concept here. Moving on to the next layer of, you know, continuing to peel the layers of these onions. From people, we move to process. And again, we've got a, you know, a solid six or seven uh, major chunks within this world. And I've described this earlier on, which is plan, buy, make, move, sell, service, and return. But if I was to distill this down for any organization, really it's two fundamental processes, possibly three. The two big ones are the order to cash process and understanding that in the omni-channel world, the order to cash process is what people need to be fueled on. Don't be departmentally focused on omni-channel, but be process focused. Understand from the point you get an order, whether it's an online order, it's a kiosk order, or it comes in from a dealer wholesaler channel, how is that going to flow through my entire organization to the point that it gets converted to cash? Fulfillment is a big component of it. The other major uh, process to look at is procure to pay. Those are the two big processes that are affected by omni-channel. For procure to pay, what it, it comes down to, how do I get my SKUs into my environment? What are my SKU attributes? Remember we talked about in SKU complexity or SKU, a plethora of SKU driving complexity in the business. So managing SKUs and their attributes becomes a very big challenge in the omni-channel world. Knowing, and we will talk a little bit more, and Eric will describe how SKU attributes determine positioning of stock within the supply chain, for example. So really, that is a fundamental part of the purchase to pay process. And getting SKU set up correctly by a vendor in your, in, in your multiple systems will start the matter. Which then gives me a segue for the third major layer, which is systems. And uh, you know, again, trying to describe the complexity of an omni-channel world. Every retailer, every manufacturer, distribution organization has multiple applications that are running through their distributed corporate environment. And uh, you know, I don't need to spend a lot of time describing this. You will recognize your ERP systems, your planning systems, your you know, your middleware that ties it all together, B2B systems, certainly online systems. Often people think in omni-channel that all you need is a transaction-based web online system to make omni-channel work. That is fundamentally incorrect. One needs to take an integrated view of all of their systems because every single application within a retailer's environment will be affected by omni-channel. I'll pause there. Every single application is going to be affected. Whether And, and, the, and the glue that holds it all together often is this notion of middleware, which is you know, omni-channel retailers certainly are moving very heavily into that direction to make different systems speak to each other and provide that flexibility in, from a technology framework perspective. So today's conversation is around move supply chain. So what we're um, you know, impressing upon uh, here with this particular diagram is this, this component right here of supply chain. All the systems that are affected today by the supply chain organization within the move process, order to cash, are systems such as your web and online systems, your B2B applications, meaning perhaps applications that your dealers are looking at or franchisees might be looking at if it's different from your ERP environment. Certainly your EDI systems that connect the vendors together for this endless aisle program that we talked about, your TMS applications and your WMS applications. So hopefully this gives a little bit of 
a background and at least helps uh, the participants understand that this is a very complex environment. I'm going to take a pause here and uh, we're going to flip real quick to a, a poll to sort of see where uh, the audience stands in their world with Omni Channel. So we will uh, we thank you for taking that poll. We'll share the results of that poll towards the end of this uh, webinar as well, and that'd be a great discussion point for our FAQ. Um, I will now set a you know this is clearly is a, is a fairly dense slide, and I recognize that. But the idea here was to impress upon the audience of of the nature the, the complex nature of omni-channel and all the moving parts that have to really be considered in this area. So let's now flip on if we if we can move on to some real-time data that, you know, that has been collected by, by research. So Forrester Research, uh, you know, just a few months ago uh, in 2013, later part of, uh, of last year, did a sort of a, a poll that has been talked about quite a bit. And the, 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 the spot poll was around consumer delivery expectations from e-commerce. Remember, today we're talking about the e-commerce or the supply chain logistics aspects of, of e-commerce and how they come into play. So the co consumers were asked, when buying online, if a product is available from multiple retailers at the exact same price, would any of the following shipping offers sway your purchase decision? What, what came out was a very interesting, and you know, some would say it's a little bit counterintuitive, but this is what came out. 75% of the consumer said that they would be swayed by a decision if they were offered an expedited, meaning two to three day, free shipping option. So they will, they're willing to live for two to three days and if it is free, they will take that. That will change where you're going to buy that you know, big screen TV that's going to get dropped to your house. Interestingly, all of the others, sort of, all the other responses came in within the same band, 18%, 14%, 9%. And uh, you know, next day shipping for a small premium, 18%. Same day shipping for a premium, well, only 14%. None of the above, these are guys who didn't know what they wanted, 9%. Now, with this sort of, you know, keeping this in mind, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, uh, to, to Eric in here and say, you know, what kind of questions does this pose for us? Thank you, uh, Neil. So unlike a, a laptop or a mobile phone or, or printer ink or, or, or books or, or small package items that are all accustomed to receiving via courier within 48 hours when we order them online these days. More and more items being sold on the web today as part of this endless aisle are items that are overdimensional, heavy, fragile, or bulky. Thinking about these items, the question that we're posing here is knowing this, would your customers, would the end consumer wait longer for a lower uh, delivered price? For example, for that large TV that Neil mentioned, an expensive aquarium, a big patio set that had six or eight pieces as part of it, a treadmill or other piece of exercise equipment, or a large heavy barbecue. This poses what we call a, a distribution uh, dilemma of three criteria of time, quality, and cost. In essence, how do we balance the lead time always maintain a high quality experience for the end consumer, but how do we also minimize our supply chain costs? So let's very quickly define all three. The lead time is the minimizing the lead time from when the consumer places their order through the web to when it's actually delivered into their home. The quality criteria is maximizing the end consumer's experience which includes things like their web order experience, ease of use of the website, ongoing communication that they receive 
uh, from their uh, a retailer in terms of, uh, yes, we've received your order. Yes, we've picked your order. Yes, we're transporting your order through the supply chain. And yes, it's going to arrive at the scheduled appointment time. And does that product uh, arrive at, 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 at your home on time and in excellent condition? And finally, and very important and very different from a bricks and mortar shopping experience, what is the in-home experience? by the carrier that drops the product off either at the threshold, in the room of choice, in the backyard, and in some cases takes all of the packaging materials away as well. And now let's balance those with the supply chain cost, recognizing that it's important that we try to minimize not just the retailer's cost components or the vendors or the distributors, but in fact minimize the end-to-end -end distribution costs in order to be able to keep pricing uh, competitive achieve the gross margin that we all want, but still have enough dollars to work with that we can keep the price low enough in order to attract the desired sales volumes. So let's conclude here that what we want to do is optimize these three criteria, but never sacrificing the quality of the end consumer's experience. This is a non-negotiable thing. Okay, let's take a look at uh, at some alternatives for residential uh, delivery or omnichannel. What we found uh, is there's been an evolution that we've seen taking place over the past five years or so. And this evolution is tied to minimizing the end-to-end -end supply chain cost. Five or six or seven years ago when retailers were really getting started, some of the earlier retailers in the e-com business, we found that they moved product through the supply chain for e-com pretty well exactly the same way as they did for bricks and mortar sales. Uh, an item like a TV uh, would uh, be ordered through their web, it would be sitting uh, in their retail store, uh, but this TV would have uh, uh, worked its way uh, from the vendor, been shipped from the vendor to the retailer's central DC, and in some cases their regional DC, uh, uh, put away into that central DC, uh, inventory picked from that DC and uh, shipped maybe to a regional DC, uh, received, put away, picked, shipped to the retailer store, received at store level, accounted for, put onto the shelf or in the back room, and then the store, upon receiving the order from the end, end consumer uh, via e-com, would, uh, would then arrange that shipment, have to label that shipment with the, with the consumer's final address, the number of pieces, the weight, the cube, all those things, and then they go out and they'd either use their own uh, fleet or they'd hire a fleet in order to get the item uh, delivered uh, to the store. A few years back, uh, some of these retailers recognized, hey, hang on a second, uh, e-com, the only thing that e-com has done over the in-store shopping experience, it's added one more cost component, and that's uh, having to make, having to pay, having the retailer have to pay for the home delivery uh, component, which they never had to do prior. So the retailer said, we can't afford that anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to leave a significant number of items, not every item, but a significant number of SKUs back in our central DC or in our regional DC. We'll wait for that order to come through our website, and then we're going to hand this off to one of a number of different carriers that we have at our disposal, we're going to allow our carriers um, in order to utilize available capacity that they have. We're going to allow our carriers to consolidate freight across all of their customers, not just us as a single customer. And we're going to recognize that then we, we can avoid this whole store component cost structure. More recently, again, a few of the a few uh, .ca and .com retailers here in Canada have said. We can go a step further than this. If we're truly committed to reducing uh, the end-to-end -end cost, let's really try to minimize every unnecessary move uh, that we can. Let's minimize the distance travel. No sense having a product which comes from a vendor in Montreal, go to a Toronto-based central DC for a retailer, and then have to be picked out of there and put on a, a carrier's network and sent to a customer in Ottawa 
we're incurring a heck of a lot of distance travel that's just not necessary. Let's also try to minimize the number of time freight is handled. Why handle it at our central DCs, which tend to be quite expensive? Why handle it in our stores? Uh, let's let our carriers handle it. Let's minimize, uh, let's give it to those whose cost per touch is less. And as I mentioned earlier, let's allow them to consolidate freight and use all their capacity. So uh, how this happens relates very much to the, how this happens with each SKU or each product relates very much to the characteristics of that product. A retailer's ability to forecast and the capabilities and the willingness of their vendors and their distributors and their carriers to take on additional tasks or a fee if that means that the retailers can get out of a great deal of their cost. Uh, given rapidly rising SKU counts that Neil talked about earlier, making these decisions has become more complex today. So let's take a look. So a key question is how do we determine where to position a product in the supply chain? Forward at the store with all of the inherent advantages of being close to the consumer or somewhere back earlier in the supply chain at the vendor or the distributor. In fact, there are a multitude of factors that we need to consider. What we'd like to speak to a few of them. First and foremost is forecast quality. The more confident a retailer is at the forecast quality that they have for any particular product in a, in a tight geographical area surrounding one of their stores, the more confident they can be that they can move that product closer to where the end consumer is going to be. doesn't apply in every case because some, product, uh, some products just don't warrant being at the store. And of course, with the rapidly expect, uh, expanding SKU counts, retailers can't afford to uh, inventory products at uh, all these SKUs at their stores. Product value is also an important component here. Uh, inventory adds up very quickly. Uh, it would be impossible uh, to pay for all of the inventory uh, to put all these products very close to the consumer at the store level, and even at the DC level, with with the rapidly expanding SKU counts, better to put them further back. Plus, all these products take up space uh, in the store. That's another factor as well. The other factor that I like to talk about is this trade-off between speed and consistency. Time and time again, uh, we have seen in real life with hundreds of customer orders that given a choice between fast and uh, un a little bit of uncertainty and a consistent lead time from when I order a product as a consumer, knowing exactly when that, is, that product is going to arrive at my home, at the planned appointment date, that's the one that I prefer. We have found that consumers understand that if I'm ordering a uh, white cedar shed uh, from uh, southern BC and I live in uh, Nova Scotia and Cape Breton, then it's going to take a little bit of time in order to get that expensive, high-quality white cedar shed to me. And if I make an agreement with that customer that they'll have it in five or six days and that they're, they're going to be home in order to receive that item, the number one thing that I have to get right is I've got to meet that promise that I have to be there at the agreed upon. That, that makes a lot of sense, um, Eric. I'll speak to the last one here. There's obviously more factors to consider, and uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the distributor and carrier's capabilities. There's, there's, you know, we talked about you know skew attributes. If I, if we may use that, but really look at the vendor attributes from where that skew is being replenished, managed, or being moved from a logistics perspective. And uh, you know we still work with a number of distribution organizations and carriers who are who are technologically just simply not ready. Um, and if they are not ready, then you do as the retailer, for example, you do have to take on the responsibility to to, to fulfill that SKU with your own set of capabilities. However, if the carriers are capable, and here are the minimum requirements, you know their service performance capability, their ability to scan uh, both inbound and outbound their ability to manage appointments, not just inbound to their DC, but actually customer appointments for home delivery. Does, do those capabilities exist and are they good uh, that you can leverage? 
uh, their existing warehouse management capability, their warehouse management systems, do they have them in place? We work with carriers who are evolving into third-party logistics companies, but they're trying to do so without a WMS. And that's a recipe for failure if you're trying to get into even a traditional distribution environment, let alone e-commerce or omni-channel. TMS and then definitely EDI and visibility capabilities. One of the fundamental requires for endless aisle, for example, is the ability to provide real-time inventory position updates from your environment, uh, excuse me, from the, from the distribution companies or your vendor's ERP system back to you. Um, so that you know what is available for sale. Remember, this available for sale may not be in your ERP system. That's just one example of real-time integration that is required. Are they available and ready for this level of technological integration? With you? So these are some of the factors to consider. There is a plethora of, of other factors uh, that we won't uh, go through in detail, but here are some uh, that are certainly there as well. Uh, think items like uh, product cube and weight and uh, breakability, also multi-piece shipments, uh, you know, seasonality. It, it just doesn't make sense, and we've seen lots of mistakes made whereby retailers move very seasonal items into the retail store, only to be caught at, at the end of the season holding a lot of items in one part of the country that, they, that uh, consumers want to order in another part of the country where the season is still ongoing. You know, seasons start early, in some areas, and they end earlier in other areas, it's very important to take that into consideration. And I guess what I would just add to that is that, you know, that is a problem in a traditional bricks and mortar supply chain, but it, you know, and, but it just uh, it gets exacerbated in an omni-channel environment where anybody can order from anywhere. So you've got to be really dynamically ready to position the stock to treat and fulfill throughout the country based on things such as product seasonality. We've also seen uh, uh, shipments that have six or eight pieces to them. By the time they get to the store level, some of those pieces haven't made it there on time. So better to touch them and handle them as, 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 as least number of times as possible. So the conclusion is that there's lots of factors and skewed characteristics that need to be considered in making decisions as to where to position a product in the supply chain in advance of an e-com sale. Okay. Let's talk a little bit, let's bring this together and let's summarize some of the trade-offs between time, cost, and position. I haven't put quality in there only because quality is something that's non-negotiable and has to be first and foremost and we will never forget about that. So there are advantages of uh, positioning a, a skew forward at the store level. Obviously when something is closest to the consumer, uh, there's the opportunity to have the shortest uh, delivery time, same day, next day. However, and, and, and products that might fit this bill would be items that are part of a core SKU assortment that you just need to have there at the store, a pro uh, products for which you're very confident in the forecast at store level, uh, products or SKUs that, are, that tend to be urgent, maybe for items uh, such as uh, car repair parts, uh, a, a barbecues prior to a long weekend, fans, uh, you know, some, some, some fans in advance of a, of a warm season, uh, uh, some core bicycles, things of that nature. Good to have some of those at the store level, of course. But uh, uh, bringing all of those SKUs or bringing too many SKUs uh, to the store level is generally going to result in a higher overall supply chain cost. And that's simply because as, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the, the retailer is going to have to incur the full retail supply chain costs of, of, of moving items into and out of uh, central D.C. and or regional D.C. Uh, and all of the steps and all the costs associated with all of these activities. One of the factors to consider here is the confidence that they have in both their vendors and their carriers. If retailers have uh, developed great relationships with their vendors and their carriers, and the carriers have spent some uh, time and attention and money on building up capabilities from a technology point of view and a process point of view and a people point of view, then the retailer uh, uh, can give some of this activity away. However, if the retailer is not confident in their vendor's uh, capabilities or the carrier's capabilities, then they have to take control of every process in the supply chain and unfortunately, in that case, incur some, some 
additional cost. The other side of the picture is if we position uh, some SKUs appropriately back earlier in the supply chain at the vendor or at the distributor, then we are likely going to incur a longer order to home delivery uh, transit time. Of course, this doesn't really apply for uh, smaller items, uh, small package products, things like electronics and cell phones and, and, and routers and jewelry and health products like, uh, like uh, blood monitors and uh, things of that nature. Those items can always be sent very inexpensively with, uh, with uh, one of Canada's four or five strong courier networks overnight. I'm talking more about the larger bulkier items, expensive items in this case. If we position those back at the vendor and don't move those until we know exactly which consumer has ordered them and where, we will likely uh, end up with a lower supply chain cost because we can avoid unnecessary transportation handling inventory costs in the retail network. We will minimize damages. Every time you handle it, there's an opportunity to damage and seize and the risk of having goods stuck in the wrong part of the country at the end of the season. And we can relieve some of this all important pressure from retail infrastructure. Retailers are finding their infrastructures are filling up and, we're, and it's a great opportunity here for retailers not to have to constantly construct larger DCs by freeing up throughput capacity. In essence, they can sell products through their through the web, they, they can be paid for those products, and those products can be moved from their source through to the end consumer without ever having to touch the retailer's own supply chain. And that can allow their carriers and their distributors uh, to do more work and make more money and overall a lower supply chain cost. So thanks, Eric. I think with that, um, we will uh, get towards uh, some sort of conclusions and sort of next steps here, and we'll open up for QA. I guess uh, we want to make sure we're, we respect people's time. We've got some great questions that are coming in. Um, so quick conclusion is a connected supply chain really matters in omni-channel, in omni-channel. And integration is really the key. Process integration, people integration, and absolutely technology integration. This is not a game that can, can be played with our integrated technology, with real-time integration back to vendor communities to help you fulfill the products up to the customer's expectation and give them a single view of, the, of, of your organization. It is, Omnichannel is complex and it affects the whole organization. So things such as incentive management within the organizations matter. Also, you know, managing supply chain partners to a different standard start to now come into play. It's not just uh, you that is dealing with your, your end customers, but your supply chain partners are now conceivably dealing uh, with them on your behalf. How is that going to work? What are their um, demands from you that they need to live up to your brand requirement? And then finally, sort of, you know, one, one size does not fit all. I think that's probably the most important takeaway. So uh, we are just uh, waiting for some from Q&A. Uh, we've got some great questions that have come in. Um, we, I guess the first poll question that we had was, uh, you know, how many people within the audience have actually moved on to uh, an omni-channel? And uh, what is really interesting to know that 86% of the, of the participants responded with a yes, uh, that they are, you know, either have embarked upon omni-channel or are very strongly considering it. So that, that I think shows, uh, you know, a really good sort of move in that direction. The second question that we had was, you know, what is your biggest um, obstacle that you're seeing towards, uh, you know, omni-channel adoption? We had, uh, you know, certain uh, criteria that we, we've given. We noted uh, with, with great interest that 67% uh, say that IT capabilities are the biggest uh, barrier to adoption. We had 50% that have also said organizational alignment. I find that very interesting because in my experience as I walk in, and I'm talking with uh, with the retailers and manufacturers. I find organizational alignment to be a fairly big issue uh, in terms of you know is everybody thinking the same thing around omnichannel and what needs to be done? Incentives, if you remember, are certainly a big component of it. Thirty-three percent uh, felt that processes for new sales and fulfillment channels are, are a problem for adoption, 
and then we had 33% also said that adequate understanding of omni-channel. So hopefully we're, we're you know helping address some of that you know with uh, with the with the trade today. So um, there's some questions that have come up, and uh, Melanie, I will uh, have you kind of put the first question out. If any participants wish to ask any questions, please raise your hand on your GoToWebinar panel, and from there we will be uh, indicating the questions, and Neil and Eric will hopefully be answering them. Any questions that we can't answer during this episode, we'll certainly contact you afterwards. Just waiting. We're just getting the, the Q&A sort of set up over here. Um, we've got uh, Tim McLaren with a question. It says, uh, EDI traditionally has required, um, sorry, just here, a little bit of technical difficulty here. Uh, EDI traditionally has required a lot of one-on-one -on -one investment between one retailer and one distributor. Are the emerging technologies making this easier, quicker uh, to implement? or allowing more flexible supply chain relationships. Tim, uh, great to see you on the webinar, first of all. And an excellent question. Um, yes, uh, EDI has evolved. Uh, for those familiar with EDI over the past 30 plus years, uh, and at least 15 to 20 years of my involvement, uh, it has it has sort of you know grown quite a bit and it has come back in vogue now with, with Omnichannel. Integration has become a really, really important part of executing an e-commerce Omnichannel type of and yes, uh, investments have have also reduced significantly with the cloud type of EDI integration. There's many models to implement that. So the answer is yes, emerging technologies such as XML, such as web services, have really brought the cost down. There are still complexities in dealing with it, but costs certainly have come down. And there's another question here. So, so we've got another question. Uh, if Kapil can please yeah. pose the question. So the question is uh, how some retailers have used this approach to their benefit. Eric, I'll let you uh, take that one on. Thank you, Neil. Um, in the last number of years, uh, having worked with a number of different retailers, I've seen both ends of the spectrum here. Uh, one, de uh, one retailer who uh, liked the uh, idea of having every product that could be ordered via the web in their stores. And that's great. Uh, it made it simple for them. It made it understandable for everyone. But uh, the amount, when they went out to contract the home delivery, the final mile component, they felt that there, you know, we all saw as carriers that there wasn't much money left over in order to do that. They, they recognized that uh, their approach was a historical approach, but maybe that they needed to change that. And they looked at another uh, large retailer who had also recognized this a few years earlier, who allowed carriers to pick up these products at the manufacturer, at the distributor, importer. By doing that, uh, there was more money for the carrier in order to do the final mile uh, delivery because the retailers save a tremendous amount of money. They save 50 to 60 to 70 dollars sometimes in large bulky items in their supply chain costs. And some of that was then able to be spent on getting carriers to do the final mile uh, delivery. So we all have DCs and terminals and trucks and people. How we differentiate ourselves is how we put it all together and how we connect it with the right technology. I've got another question coming in. Uh, the question is like this. So SQ count, as you mentioned, has been adding complexity in the whole omnichannel. So what are the ways of reducing this omnichannel complexity, Neil? Okay, so let me repeat the question in case people didn't uh, understand that. Uh, the question is, uh, there is, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of SKU complexity. There's an increase of SKUs. And the question is, how can we reduce, uh, you know, the complexity that is associated uh, with SKUs? The reality is, the short answer is that you know, by utilizing a framework to, uh, to help uh, you know implement omnichannel, it is a complex world, and you must take an integration approach to solving this problem. 
if, uh, you know, if silos within the organization, silos within technology have created problems in the past, it is, it is going to become an unmanageable problem when it comes to omni-channel execution. So, and certainly SKU explosion is driving a lot of that. So having a simple framework um, that one can understand the impact points throughout the organization. Um, you know, I talked about peeling the layers of the onion, understanding, you know, what are the, the moving parts there, and really sort of taking that into perspective and utilizing that framework uh, to, to reduce the complexity will move forward and make sure that you're systemically ready, make sure that integration is in place. And it's not just the, the sheer number of SKUs, it's the type of SKUs and all of their individual selling uh, characteristics. Yep. How many they're going to sell, their value, their weight, their breakability, their size, their urgency, uh, the consumer's seasonal buying patterns, these all need to be considered. Uh, let me just uh, add an anecdotal point here. Uh, I was with a retail organization just uh, three weeks ago, uh, and we were going through the, you know, they've been doing Omnichannel for a while, and, uh, you know, they've, they've got several, you know, they're, ten, they're in the tens of thousands of SKUs. There are smaller retailers that are listed on Omnichannel. And here's the interesting problem that's been posed. Uh, it takes them six weeks to introduce a new product uh, into their environment from the point that a vendor makes a submission uh, for a new product to the point that that product is set up in their ERP system and online systems and is therefore available for sale. It takes them six weeks. They need to go from 10,000 SKUs to over a million SKUs. You know, if you remember that, it, and it, in a very quick math told them that even a small sub-component of the process, which is item, new item setup, will simply bring their organization to a grinding halt. They will have to hire tens more people to help set up new items and get those to market. You know, so, you know, th this can't be done in the traditional thinking that we have in place today. Hopefully that can help understand that. I think we are, uh, uh, Philip, you can ask your question, please. Uh, there's a question from Philip. Yeah. Uh, so Philip has a question. I'll just read it out. Uh, do you agree that most of the vendors would be the laggard in ramping up their IT capabilities to work with both retailers and carriers, 3PLs? Um, Philip, I, I will, I'll have to say that I hate to agree with you, but the fact of the matter is I will agree with you that vendors are slower at this point to adopting IT and capabilities. In fact, uh, you know, retailers are the ones who are forced to move forward. Omnichannel has come in retail first. That's where the consumer is going. So you know, retailers are putting a lot of investments, and they're getting ready for omnichannel in a big way. The uh, you know the the slowness in this entire sort of um, uh, the bottleneck has been the vendor community, and uh, you know their ability to quickly react and integrate to retailers is still a big problem. And I'll tell you a bigger problem from the vendors is the carrier and the distributor community, which is really sort of you know in the dark ages in terms of you know what they can do versus what they're expected to do in, as they move forward. And we're hopeful that the you know that service provider community will really kind of get up to speed with them. Retailers are spending a tremendous amount of money uh, making big investments in people and technology in order to get into this game. But in some cases, carriers are lagging behind as well from a technology point of view. Things like payment and commerce technology, uh, being able to do automated appointment management through a carrier website or a retail website uh, connected to a carrier website, uh, warehouse management uh, technology upgrades, uh, transportation management, things like dynamic routing for uh, incoming orders on the fly end-to-end -end scanning, not just scanning when a carrier receives a product and uh, uh, POD scanning at the end when they, when they deliver it to the end consumer, but a scan every time a carrier moves a product from one facility to an next. Uh, capacity planning and finally management reporting and PDI are all technologies that retailers are expecting carriers to upgrade in. Are there any other questions uh, coming in, Kapil? I think yeah. we're coming up to our time, and I think uh, we should. Uh, if there are more questions, I think we should please feel free to email it. Our, you know, Eric's uh, email ID is there at the bottom of the screen, and so is uh, so is mine. And perhaps uh, finally, we can move towards uh, wrapping it up. 
Yep, so you'll be receiving an email with a link to the recording of the webinar. And I'd just like to thank our speakers, Eric and Neil, for speaking today regarding this topic. And on behalf of Spice Technology, we'd just like to thank everyone for participating and have a great day. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you, everyone.